Hello, and welcome to Bad Adaptations, where we talk about films and TV shows that were once books. Bad Adaptations, films that were once books. Today's episode is our special first edition of Bad Adaptations. Since the month of May is the birthday month of Audrey Hepburn, our Lordess and Savior, <laughs> um, we would start with drum roll. Breakfast at Tiffany's. So the book was written by Truman Capote, published 1958, and the film was um, released in 1961. So most of you are, that are watching are probably significantly more familiar with the movie than the book. And that's the case for me. Actually, I only read the book for this video. <laughs> and I am the complete opposite. In high school, I went through a deep, deep Truman Capote face and decided I was going to read his entire collection and Breakfast at Tiffany's was the first. Inner high school Stephanie is really looking forward to talking about the movie. Let's launch into sort of our comparison. Um, so I'll say that the, the book is quite different from the film. Yeah, so I think the best thing is to crush all of the hopes and dreams of our viewers out there now oh who have found the deepest possible meaning of romance and love in the Audrey Hepburn version of this. Be prepared, this book will crush your soul. Ugh. We actually don't get the narrator's name, mm -hmm. do we? So in the film, he's Paul uh, Varjak. He's a writer, and as a writer, a lot of his conflict with Holly in the book comes from Holly not appreciating his craft. At one point, I remember this because she mentions another book that we might do on this um, on this video channel. He asks her like, "What is a book that like means something?" And she replies, "Wuthering Heights." Um, only he realizes that she's only seen the film when she says, "Oh, I cried so much when I watched it." <laughs> the nameless narrator in this book is so different than the Papard character. The relationship that he has with Holly is just a very deep-seated friendship. This is actually a quote from the book. For I was in love with her, just as I had once been in love with my mother's elderly colored cook and a postman who let me follow him on his rounds, and a whole family named McKendrick. That category of love generates jealousy, too. And that really distinguishes his relationship with Holly, where all the other people that interact with her really just want to have sex with her. One character that's in the book that um, we don't see in the film really is Joe Bell. And he seems to be the one that actually is in love with Holly, but it's also this weird idealized love. But Holly in both the book and the movie is a manic pixie dream girl. Basically it's a, like a woman who a man stumbles upon and she's kooky and quirky and wonderful and kind of, you know, needs someone to help her out, but she ends up being the one to help a man along his journey of finding himself. I think this is a good point to start talking about the character that Audrey Hepburn created and the character that Capote himself created. Right, so I mean the first thing is the two characters, Holly and, well, book Holly and film Holly, look very different. It's important to note that there is a pretty big beef uh, between Capote and the film adaptation. So Truman Capote actually hated Audrey Hepburn. And you'll see this in some of her like biopics. There's an awful biopic with Jennifer Love Hewitt. Oh, oh, it's really bad, but you should watch it. <laughs> but it's really bad. So the person that he actually wanted is Marilyn Monroe. So try picturing the iconic black dress and pearl choker and cigarette holder eating outside of Tiffany's as Marilyn Monroe, who herself became iconic for a certain dress. Right. Yeah, right. Well, Book Holly is described as having short, boyish hair, mm -hmm. and it's blonde, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, very different from Audrey's love, the classic brunette hair. In the film, in the opening, it's this iconic opening scene where she's standing outside Tiffany's and eating a croissant. She's looking in on Tiffany's and she's got the black dress, the slim black dress, the pearls. So the dress is by Givenchy and he designed her dress for Sabrina, which was released previous to Breakfast at Tiffany's. Exactly, and that dress has become the most iconic element of Audrey Hepburn in general. I'm sure some of you have had those Audrey Hepburn posters of yep. her in her iconic costume, and it's actually transcended to the point where Audrey Hepburn and that black dress is everything about 
glamour. Right. We tend to romanticize it, mm -hmm. um, despite the fact that it is quite a sad film, yeah. and at parts it is quite dark. So this isn't, I don't think this is in the book, but George Papard's character has this decorator. But anyway, she is married, um, but she pays for his apartment in the film, but she pays checks for him to stay there and presumably write. Um, but he doesn't end up writing until Holly shows up. Tell me, do you write every day? Sure. Today? Sure. It's a beautiful typewriter. Of course. It writes nothing but sensitive, intensely felt, promising prose. But there's no ribbon in it. We also have the, the female prostitution. So Holly is euphemism of going to the powder room right. and negotiating prices. Mr. Arbuck, he only gave her, what, 20 cents? <laughs> I guess when I was watching the film, I didn't really understand was prostitution because it was like 20 cents. The book is still racist, but the film is also very racist. Mickey Rooney, who plays Mr. Yuniyoshi, who's Japanese, in the book and the film. It's a very stereotypical um, portrayal of an Asian character, particularly the yellow face, and they make his eyes very slinty, he's very mad, he's always yelling, and he's just a caricature. And that does not really enhance the Yuniyoshi character in the text is, is very minimal. Yeah. He's not in a lot. He's really only in the beginning. And actually when um, Joe Bell and the narrator are talking about him, um, Joe Bell is the really racist one calling mm -hmm. him, oh, that Jap. Um, but the narrator reminds him, or tries to remind him, that Yuniyoshi's actually from California. <laughs> um, and he speaks very eloquently. So they did actually change that in the film. They made him more racist. But the book also has some um, unsavory uh, components to it. At the beginning of the book, we actually see Holly very different from the film. She's not at Tiffany's dining. She, instead, she is in Africa, which is, the, it's assumed she's in Africa because there is a totem that has been carved of her. And there's some talk in the beginning of the text that she slept with Africans and that becomes something that is seen as problematic in the text because you have this white woman going out to Africa and venturing out there and sharing a mat with African men and again that's that's how we see her at the end. We talked about the racism in the book and now um, I think we're going to talk a little bit about the sexuality mm -hmm. which is completely <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> except for normative heterosexual within the conjugal confines of marriage sexuality that you see in the film, not the book. But I think it's it's interesting to start this discussion off with just a quick reading of Capote's biographer's kind of story of where the title Breakfast at Tiffany's came from. Truman had once heard an anecdote and fil filed it away waiting for the time he could use it. The anecdote was basically, during World War II, a man of middle age entertained a Marine one Saturday night. The man enjoyed himself so much in the Marine's muscular embrace that he felt he should buy him something to show his gratitude. But since it was Sunday when they woke up and the stores were closed, the best he could offer was breakfast. Where would you like to go, he asked. Pick the fanciest, most expensive place in town. The Marine, who was not a native, had heard the, of the only one fancy and expensive place in New York, and he said, let's have breakfast at Tiffany's. <laughs> but yeah, another aspect of the sexuality is that in the book, Holly is probably bisexual, and we don't hear about this at all in the film. I'd settle for Garbo any day. Why not? A person ought to be able to marry men or women or, listen, if you came to me and said you wanted to hitch up with men or war, I'd respect your feeling. No, I'm serious. Love should be allowed. Yeah, so this... I don't know, this seems like a big departure from the film, where we do have that resuscitation of heterosexual love. So she seems to be um, more open about um, same-sex relationships in the book than the film even dares to touch upon. The character Paul, I want so much to dislike him. My name is Paul, Paul Varjak, and I love you. We go. Not till we get this settled. He has this rhetoric, you know, like, oh, we belong to each other, you're mine, I love you, and he expects her to just roll over and be like, oh, I love you too. And of course, actually, she doesn't in the library scene where she just stares at him. Um, uh, but <laughs> can you blame them? Like, he's just so good looking. I mean, we talked about Audrey's appearance, but let's just have, like, 
a moment of appreciation for George Peppard. I'm just gonna let this roll for just a few minutes. He's just so dreamy. <laughs> So another thing, like we're both academics and we both actually do disability mm -hmm. studies. So just really quickly, we sort of wanted to touch upon disability drag in the book and somewhat, not so much in the film, but in the book for sure. Yeah. And so disability drag comes from Tobin Sievers. And basically disability drag is where you emphasize a disability. Owing to the ideology of ability, the more visible the disability, the greater the chance that the disabled person will be repressed from public view and forgotten. The masquerade shows that disability exists at the same time that it, as masquerade, does not exist. Mm -hmm. And so we actually see this with Mag Wildwood and her stutter, which is significantly more prominent in the text. Mm -hmm. Capote actually creates stutter in the way that she writes, and so if she says she, it'll be S-S-S, she. Um, so you're seeing that stutter in the book. But she also is using this stutter in a really constructive way. Even the stutter, certainly genuine, but still a bit laid on, had been turned to advantage. It was the master stroke, that stutter, for it contrived to make her banality sound somehow original. And secondly, despite her tallness, her assurance, it served to inspire in male listeners a protective feeling. Men are often intimidated by her. So the book paints this overemphasizing of the stutter as actually getting men to be more comfortable with her because now they're, it's assumed, superior in some way. They have something over her. So the last thing we'll talk about in this video is, are, well, the endings. Um, so the book ends on uh, the narrator finding the cat who has found this other home and he wonders about Holly whether she's found a home too. Um, the film on the other hand um, they are together in the taxi. Holly I'm in love with you. So what? So what? So plenty. I love you. You belong to me. No. People don't belong to people. Of course they do. I'm not gonna let anyone put me in a cage. I don't want to put you in a cage. I want to love you. It's the same thing. This is a little bit more like Book Holly, where she kind of ends up who knows where, not with the narrator. But of course in the film, they want to sort of tie ends up neatly. She ends up staying, getting Cat from the alley. Um, it's raining, they have Cat in between them, and they end up kissing in the rain. Oh, so romantic. So anyways, we haven't talked about this, but we'll give our opinions as to whether um, the film is a bad adaptation, a good adaptation, or if we're kind of just like on the fence, a meh adaptation. So why don't you go first? Okay, this is really unpopular. I, I think it's a bad adaptation. I honestly am not a big fan of Breakfast at Tiffany's. I think a lot of it comes from the cultural impact it's had and how Audrey Hepburn's character, the Holly Gall Lightly, has become so idealized in a film that needs a lot more critical mm -hmm. um, attention. So I think it's a bad adaptation from the text to the film. And I, it's a decent film, but it's not, I don't know, all, all around I would say, I would say bad adaptation. And I am the exact opposite. I think because of the cultural impact of the film, we know the film better. I'll say it's a good adaptation. Um, if we are looking at um, text to film in terms of adaptation, absolutely, it's a bad adaptation. There's a lot missing there. It has an entirely different feel than the Truman Capote mm -hmm. book. But I did see the film first. It's a classic. I think it's a good adaptation in the sense that it has created this lasting image. Um, and it really is this touchstone for film. I'm glad that we have this. <laughs> We're starting off with a disagreement. So that's fun. And I think the most interesting discussions that we have are the ones where we disagree. Let us know what you think in the comments. If you have um, suggestions for future videos, books and films, also TV shows, let us know in the comments. Um, we're a new channel, so like and subscribe and share with your friends. And check out our WordPress site where we will have more recommended resources. So that'll be linked below, and we will see you next time. Thank you for watching, and as a gift to you, my cat Bill, <laughs> who didn't want to be in this video. He's not like the cat in the. Oh, yeah, no. In Breakfast at Tiffany's, but he is quite photogenic, so. Yes. We can also get Truman. Let's try to intersperse more cats. <laughs> Off the hook. So thank you. Planet.
meditations, please leave.